Filmmakers make films, but films make filmmakers. From blockbuster premieres to grindhouse theaters, late night cable to the local video store, there is no greater classroom for aspiring filmmakers than cinema itself. Join your host, Eric Skorzynski, as he dives deep into the minds of legendary directors, producers, actors, and more to discover their biggest influences and to explore the impact their films are leaving behind. This is Film School. Grab your popcorn. Class is about to begin. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Film School podcast. Katie, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. How are you? Doing pretty good. And I have to say, you are a first for the show in the sense of none of my other guests have shared a crack pipe with Nicolas Cage. So... (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about that experience because you've had multiple times in your career, you've worked alongside some pretty uh, huge actors and have been in some interesting uh, scenes. What are moments like that? Are they surreal still? Uh, what, what's the feeling in moments like that? Yeah. Sometimes people just bring it up like just now out of nowhere. And I'm just <laughs> like, oh yeah, I did that. Cause like when you're in it, you're just in it, you're doing it and you don't, you don't think about it. And it's not like I like sit home, twiddle my thumbs, be like, oh yeah, I worked with Nicolas Cage for an Herzog, you know, hand selected me and called me and specifically asked me to be on the ro- like on the project. Like, you know, you just kind of go on with life and and make, you keep creating the next thing. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, it was prolific. I remember going in and meeting Werner, the director and, um, you know, um, Joanna Ray, who cast all of, you know, um, Quentin Tarantino's films, uh, you know, she said in 25 years, it was one of the best auditions she's ever seen in her whole career. Mm. So that kind of testimonial, those things, I feel so honored and they go deep within my soul. Um, Jenny Ju cast it as well. Um, and then, and then I was on a film in Shreveport and the producer tells me from me rapping and, you know, he just offered me the opportunity. And I just felt in that moment as I, as if I was Joan Crawford, you know, my yeah, jaw was right. just dropped. And I was just like, yes, yes. Thank you so much. So, um, and then it was wonderful because I had about, I think about three weeks to gear up and prepare to meet the iconic Nicolas Cage. <laughs> and so he doesn't know this, but, you know, as an actor, everyone prepares and as an artist as a human, we just prepare for, you know, the time, the day, whatever. And, uh, and I was just having all these fantasies and letting my mind run wild. And just, I would be dreaming, you know, reading the script and going back and looking for nuances and excited to see the development of his character and the choices I made for my character. And it was really, really, uh, blastful because when we actually worked together, he was just like, oh. like yeah. I think I just blew his socks off. And when I'm blowing off Nicholas Cage's socks, literally, I'm just like, wow, that feeling was just so awesome because of, you know, his merit, his career of who yeah. he is, the body of work, just to connect with such a force was, like I said, a deep, deep honor. This is worth $60,000. Doesn't that get us past attempted? Where's the rock at? Come on, come on. Who's got the kibble? You want a hit? Yes. I, I can't imagine being in moments like that, that you could imagine as a, a younger, you know, as a kid or as a teenager thinking about acting, that these are the kind of opportunities you'd have. When, when did you first get interested in acting? Was there a certain film or a certain show that really captured your attention and, and got you thinking creatively like that? Yeah, I'm going to answer the question, but what comes to my mind, um, first I want to say is I remember uh, admiring Reese Witherspoon, Meryl Streep, Leonardo DiCaprio. I remember when I was uh, a little girl, those were some of my inspirations. I love their choices, their crafts, the movies they were in. Uh, But taking me back to what actually got me involved in acting was Care Bears. I mean, I love Care Bears. I I, I voice over act now. And I didn't know they were voiceover actors when I was a kid. But all the colors with the animation and it's acting. But I didn't know, you know, that kind of acting. But it's developmental in such a way. But I guess that's when it really started for me. And I was just like, 
uh, a kid in a candy store, um, you know, like Cartoon Katie is my branded name for voiceovers now. So um, I think, I think, um, you know, Rainbow Bright, My Little Pony, He-Man, watching those shows earlier on um, really got me into a fantasy play way of being involved in acting, which I didn't even know at the time they were voiceover actors. But for films uh, and TV shows, I grew up on classic Full House. Um, We weren't allowed to watch um, Married with Children. You know, The Simpsons were popular. It's another animation show. Um, You know, I I was exposed to some art films when I was a kid. Um, Mm -hmm. My family is Greek Orthodox Christian. So um, I, they would always have the Greek movies on and the Greek TV shows. So sometimes I couldn't understand what they were saying. I was yeah. watching the acting and I was, I opened me up to more international films instead of just American, like cookie cutter films, which I think it gave me more of a provocative, um, palette, uh, a more risque, um, desire for films. Did, um, did, you, did your family encourage this interest in films and wanting to be in films or did they want you to go a more traditional path? Um, my yaya did. My grandmother, who's my best friend, who I'm named after, Kiryaki, she's a saint, Saint Kiryaki. Um, she inspired me. She's a poet and she, you know, um, is a singer. And, you know, she and her, she exposed me to, you know, well, Greek mythology and all the best poets and, you know, the language and unconditional love and food and culture. So I definitely feel like I learned a lot um, because of her. Uh, My mom and dad, they were, you know, um, nine to five. And my dad's parents came from the old country. So um, they came from very humble beginnings. And worked 40 hours a week, had four kids when they were kids, you know, teenagers having kids. And um, they gave us a lot of discipline and they did their best um, to educate us with, you know, um, practicalities. And my dad, you know, was a cross-country runner. So I learned about short-term, medium-term, long-term goals. They always instilled independence and for us to do whatever we wanted to do and that we could just research, educate, learn, and go after it. They didn't spoon feed us anything. They didn't give us anything besides, I don't want to say the basic needs and, you know, but yeah, I mean, they, but there wasn't like extensions of, you know, the three-dimensional materialistic world or having things in favoritisms or anything like that. We were, you know, taught grassroots about morals, values, and ethics and, and going after what we wanted. Um, my mom always watched the Academy Awards at this and, you know, the Emmys, all the, all the award shows, the musical award shows we did as a family. And I was always seeing like everyone getting the golden statues and the, you know, all the awards. Um, and we watched all these, classic films with my mom. And so she definitely turned me on to a lot of like eighties movies and classical classic movies. Yeah. What did education look like for you when it came to, you know, preparing for this as a career path? Was it a desire to go to film school? Was it just learning by doing what was kind of the the process by which you educated yourself? Well, Um, I'm always into the school of life. So I want to say I'm self-taught. I did have some training and some classes, um, but I didn't go to Columbia or like a New York film Academy um, for a four-year degree for acting. Um, I've studied with everyone that you can think about. Susan Batson, B-A-T-S-O-N. She has a great book called Truth. She's Nicole Kidman's acting coach for the last maybe over 18 years, Juliette Binoche, uh, Madonna, Oprah. Like um, I studied with Leslie Kahn. She's great for comedy, K-A-H-N. She's great for comedy. Um, She's based out of LA. Margie Haber, you know, she did Tori Spelling and the 90210 shows back in the day. Um, I mean, the list goes on of, of all the people I studied with when I moved to Hollywood and then when I went to New York City. But prior to getting there, um, 
I took acting classes growing up in school, journalism, speech, communication, those kind of things. I won Miss Michigan Teen. So I, I, um, sent as, um, Miss Michigan Teen Motor City, it's called, but so I, I, what, um, I, went around America and I was working with the auto show with articulation and thousands of people. And I was the star and I had all this education and people were coming up to me and I was a model. And, you know, so that was great training to understand, um, you know, language and communicating with the different breeds of people in America. And it was, it's what got me to come to California, which is really exciting and opportunity. Um, but, Um, I studied, yeah, in school and I took classes and then I met Gordon Michaels before I came to California and he's in the entertainment industry. He's friends with uh, Dylan McDermott. He's best friends with him. And he was on the practice at the time and he had a weekend workshop in Northville, Michigan. And I could only attend one day and I went and just takes one person. I mean, that's how it is. That's how it was then. And that's how it is now. Everything's who, you know, it's referral base. I mean, you can cold call 300 people for sure and maybe get one response, but it's all about relationship. So I learned a lot from him. Um, and then that was, that was just a one day class. And then I was able to, you know, contact him when I uh, uh, ended up venturing out to California. Yeah. What what was the first opportunity you had in California to actually get on screen, to actually put your, your act into the test? Mm, well, those are two different questions. So the question mm. you're asking me is different than the one I wanted to bridge and share with you. But I guess uh, the first opportunity would be um, knowing Gordon Michaels and I had two Taft Hartleys and I needed one more to be in the union. So my first big break was to get into the union and they put me on the practice as an extra. Mm. And then I stomped up to the union and paid $1,400 at the time. I think it's like over probably over $3,400 now, but then it was in 2001, it was, I paid um, $1,400 and I, you know, went and got to be a part of the union because I, you know, had my three Taft Hartleys. Um, the first opportunity that bridged me uh, a landing role on TV was in 2005, um, CSI New York with Gary Sinise. He'd sneak out at night, make it all the way to the ocean and back before morning. You never went with him. I have two older brothers and a father watching my every move. I'm stuck here. Lucas was off limits. Just like in the show. Lucas was Romeo. And I was Juliet. It was amazing working with him and um, his co-star, who's, you know, a fellow Greek actor who goes to my church, St. Sophia's Mm. at Normandy and Pico. Um, And he told me when we were working together, he said, you're a very soulful actor. And so that was really amazing to have that golden nugget. So early on in my career from Gary Sinise, you know, who, who played in Forrest Gump. It was like, whoa, it was mind boggling. Yeah. What, what's the emotion getting onto a show like that for the first time? You know, what, what's the feeling when you're getting the call saying, Hey, you've got this part. Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it excitement? All the above? It's all of it. It's all of it. But I remember when I booked that role, I was with Jesse McCartney and he had this song come out. It was called Beautiful Soul. And I remember him and I think it was he was with Katie Cassidy at the time. And they were in the living room watching the music video with, with our other um, friend. And I was in the room. And these people are already like known working celebrities. And I'm like trying to get my first role here. <laughs> and so um, I'm in the bedroom and I'm just like studying my lines. And not only am I studying my lines, but I had to go to a place that I normally wouldn't go to. And I took a risk and I went there in my psyche. And I didn't want to have the the regret to going there because I didn't want it to happen. But I took a chance and it didn't happen, which is good, but I did book the role. Um, So it's such a fearful place. It's such a risky place. Sometimes as an actor, because we need to go past our 60 to 70,000 thoughts we have per day. We need to get past our own emotions 
because we get so stuck on our emotions of how we're feeling of where we are of what other people think of the divine circumstances of what we've been brainwashed and what we've learned along the way thus far that we forget and we don't know how to get unstuck unnumb, and not to be paralyzed and frozen from what we already think we already know even if it's a fantasy we get stuck in fantasies i feel so it was a big risk to go there and i'm i'm glad i did and it's what got me the role and i think when i've taken it doesn't all have to be detrimental risk but when i've been able to go to a place past my emotions and past what i think i already know of doing the work and research when I'm able to bust through those places and it's difficult to do that. Um, I can't say I book all the time when I do that because I don't, but every time that I do do that, those are the roles I have booked. Where does the power of a performance come from? If not those immediate emotions and thoughts that we're experiencing and we're, we're grounded in those things. Usually that's where we're living is what we know, what we see, what we feel in the moment. Where does the power in a performance come from? What, what place does that come from? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think if you're into pranayama and consciousness and life force, I mean, it's something macro and micro bigger than we can really humanly understand and know. Um, but there's a drive and a force and there's a collective energy and consciousness about our every moment to moment choices and, you know, choices, decisions that we make and that, that are made for us um, that shape shift the moment that we have now. So it's not just the moment we have now, even though we have the power to make a choice. I feel like it's a collective choices that make up the the right now. So that's going to ultimately fire your chi to have that forceful energy to be here, or it's going to, you know, or, or one could be a bit depleted, like, (laughs) um, you know, um, based off of, intentions and and focuses and, and based on, I think what we eat too, you know, it's like, we are what we eat. And so are we eating processed foods? Are you getting like, are you watching E, 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 D films and E films? Are you watching A grade films, right? Are you eating like, like greens and not, you don't have to be a vegan, but I mean, are you eating like mindfully? Are you, are we aware of our environment, right? Of the toxic chemicals of our environment, of what's on the TV, of who we keep in our company, all of that makes or breaks our choices. Like, I mean, I've done a lot in my career, but also the, the, the certain things that have, you know, haven't happened in my career are based off of, you know, personal choices, but even that isn't quote unquote bad or good. It's just an experience. It's all energy. So from that experience of that energy, I can one day put it into a voiceover role or an acting role or into a poetry piece or to a song. So it, it's it's like, you know, it's not like um, yes or no, good or bad. It's just where are we choosing to put this energy? And if, we, if, we, if we're not making the choice, it's making the choice for us. So it's if we're aware of that energy, that power, that force we have, or if we're unaware. And a lot of people are unaware of their power And a lot of people are unaware of what's happening. There's a lot going on in the world. It's difficult. You know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. hard to keep up. And, and when we're in it, it's really difficult. So that's why it's really important to have a community of people who support us, who can be real in a gentle, kind way, in a healthy way to make sure we're bridging healthier connections. And when that happens, then we're going to do, you know, eat healthier and make and watch more quality projects. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. when you talk about community, how much does it help a performance or that mental headspace when you're working across from someone who is a Nicolas Cage, or you're working across from someone who does go to this other level, you know, these people who are the best of the best, what effects that have on you as a performer? It elevates me. It makes me rise. It it makes it it just everything else melts away. If there's, you know, you just, you just rise, everything else melts away. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's an honor. It's a, it's um, a miracle, you know, it's a miracle. And so, um, and then I can reflect to see how I could be that for another, right. And Mm -hmm. be mindful of that to not have an ego take over or feel like I'm superior or entitled and to be able to share with other communities what I learn. So I like to get involved in communities and learn, and then they fill up my cup. And then I like to 
take that, enjoy it because a lot of people will get their cup filled and then they want to fill other people's cup. But when someone fills your cup, we have the opportunity to really embrace and enjoy that. Um, but then pay it forward, you know? So I think it's just like I was saying a moment ago, it's just a cycle of energy, right? Yeah. What, what's the difference between say, it, because we've, we've all seen or heard of projects where, you know, there's this one upmanship of, okay, I'm against this person. I need to stand out. You know, I need to be the person that runs this, you know, and, and I have to imagine in some of the situations where that you've been in, which are many, it's, it's, surprising like how many times you've been across from someone who does i mean a gary sinise a nicholas cage a jessica simpson at the height of her fame you know uh, it's always sunny in philadelphia sitting aside from comedic you know geniuses there's got to be a temptation to try to do something over the top and draw all the attention to yourself as opposed to working for the good of the scene um you know what what's the difference between bringing in energy and trying to help elevate everybody versus kind of bringing the spotlight on yourself. Hey guys. I am so glad you guys came. Well, um, we ran into a little bit of a problem. My brother, he was supposed to pick up the keg, but he bailed on me. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. It totally sucks. So, um, we were wondering if maybe you guys could help us out. Oh, you mean, no, I don't, no, Jeez, I yeah. don't think that's such a good idea. Yeah. Listen, it's one thing at the bar, you know, where we have control over you guys. It's like another thing. Oh, come on, please, please. You guys have been so cool. Yeah, we were just talking about how cool you guys were. Really? You were? Mm -hmm. This would be the coolest thing that anyone's ever done for us. Ever. Ever. Who wants to do a cake stand? Oh, I mean, it's, it's not about bringing spotlight on self at all, because it's all about doing the work and the craft of acting. because being in Puerto Rico, working with Mila Jovovich and Steve Zahn, I don't need to put the spotlight on me. They know it's their movie and I'm coming in and I'm yeah. an accessory and it's a collective that we're working together. Like when you get booked and you have your contract and you're in Puerto Rico shooting a perfect getaway, there's no proving to have the limelight on you you're, you're doing your, that would be maybe, um, a part of it when you're competing quote and competing for the role, when you're just mm -hmm. in the audition with a bunch of people that you just don't even see and thousands yeah. you're up for, you know, there's thousands of roles, but when you're there, <laughs> if anything, there is excitement, um, there's nervousness, but there's professionalism. So it's not like, Oh, can I have your autograph or, Hey, can we take right. a photo together? Like, all of, all of that's not allowed. And, and maybe it is allowed, but I guess, I guess for me and the rules that I created for myself, um, no on set, I would, I didn't have my cell phone. I would never take a photo. Maybe if it's like offset, you ask for a photo or something like that. But the best thing one can do is just know your lines, mm -hmm. know the meeting, work with your acting coach and do great work and be coachable. So the director can coach you. So they like you and that you're easy to work with. And so you can get to lunch and so <laughs> you can wrap the day. So then that you can work with them in the next movie, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to be a big deal or you don't want to be um, a, a hard nut. You don't want to be that yeah. at all. Like your ego needs to be like checked at the ocean. Like there's, there's no room for that. So that's how you can collectively be adding value for the project, you know? He says that they're looking for two people, a man and a woman. That's all I got. It's like that movie, huh? It's uh, Natural Born Killers. <gasps> oh my God, that movie like totally freaked me out when his head was doing that Majorly. Thing. Yeah, we talk about that a lot with, um, I work on another business podcast. We've gotten to interview some amazing athletes and, you know, high level people. And, you know, one of the things we always talk about when people are asking for advice, going to these situations is you can set yourself up very early on as a peer, as someone who's another professional and working and, you know, understanding your role. Again, you're not, you're not going to pretend, you know, sitting across from an Al Pacino, like I'm an Al Pacino 2.0. That's, that's, you know, you, you can't do that. But you can set yourself up as a professional peer, or you can set yourself up as a fan. And, you know, it's okay to be a fan, <laughs> but it's not going to help you in a setting where you're trying to collaborate with somebody on that, on that next level. 
Oh, no. I mean, you have to, I guess it's just natural for me because it's me, but you have to, for anyone who isn't me, right? Which is everyone. Um, we, it's none we of us to, are you. Yeah. None of, <laughs> no, no one here. No one here is listening. No one here is me, but we, we need to hold our own. Like mm-hmm. everyone you mentioned that I've worked with, I've always just held my own. When I'm so confident with myself and, you know, you already go through 17 hoops before you're on mm-hmm. set. So you have to be a, a, a diligent person with a lot of strength to, you know, to the being on set is the chair, right? The work is getting to the set, you know, like when you're on the set, you get to play and have fun. You've already read the scene so many times. You've already slept on it so many times, you know, like you've already done your work. So when you go to show up on set, you've already signed your contracts. You already know how much you're making. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? It's you get to have fun when you're on the set. Yeah. And so it is a way to bridge amazing connections with, with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to move this a little bit practical because there's a lot of people listening to the show who are aspiring actors, aspiring filmmakers, fill in the blank, something in the industry they want to break in. Yeah. And you know, with 2020, 2021 COVID has changed that. what you can be around how networking looks. (laughs) And one thing that I admire about you, you know, looking at all the different things you're involved in, you're working on music, you're working on and have the NFT space. You're working on, uh, I'm sure, auditioning. You know, sending in tapes and and you know, going for it. What should people be focused on? Because it doesn't seem like you can just sit and wait for the opportunity. You know, it seems like there's uh, there's a lot that can be done to try to fill this space and and make a name for yourself. Mm-hmm. Honestly, one thousand percent. The good old days of the yellow pages is over. And that's where I was. I was looking up yellow pages when I was a teenager, looking at all the acting agencies and the modeling agencies, not knowing anyone. And all the ones that called me who wanted money, I knew they were scams. The ones that didn't call me, there was only like three in Michigan. There were only like three or four. I'm like, that's my target. That's the one I want. Right. So that was then. Then you have the whole trajectory of going to Hollywood. Samuel Friends bookstores closed down. No, nope, not happening. Um, Actors Access, actorsaccess.com. You can get a free account. <clears throat> they have um, this uh, thing where you pay a monthly fee one time. It's in LA or New York. I think it's LA, New York, maybe Atlanta. And um, and you can pay and put your resume headshot. And there's agencies looking for maybe people of your type. And then you can take some meetings virtually. Uh, that's what happened during the pandemic. Um, Samuel, like I said, Samuel French books are closed down. It used to be an, an agent book, um, and a manager book, $10 every month. And it said no solicited materials, or this is what we're looking for. And it could be a friendly way for you to send in your materials, uh, by, you know, via a yellow envelope. And then everything went digital to emails. Um, and during the pandemic, I, um, you know, uh, New Mexico is a big market, LA, New York, New Mexico, Atlanta. And I was on um, Actors Connection. It's actorsconnection.com, free at three and um, in New York. And there was an agent from New Mexico in Texas. Hmm. And I wrote her immediately right after. And, and then we scheduled a meeting. We were on the on a call for one hour and she sent the paperwork. And during the pandemic, I got representation for an on-screen agency in New Mexico, which is insane. So that was awesome. Uh, and that was prolific. And that is an opportunity to shape shift and everything is up in the air and um, everything is through referrals. So um, knowing someone, even if it doesn't matter how, you know, I'm just like, when you do unsolicited things, even now it's, it's all relationship based. So it's really important to cultivate authentic relationships. And even though like in my mind, I might be like zero to hero, right? Zero to 100, which I've done so many times. I burnt the candle out so fast with people because they're like, whoa. And like, even though my mind is so fast, they're like, whoa. And like, it's like too much. And for me, I'm like, I'd rather be blastful and upfront and just like, let them know who I am because then you get rid of like all the no's or all the people who shouldn't be a part of your, you know, community. And you get to like what you want a lot faster. So there's that fine line 
but also it's like, so if you vibe and you like someone, maybe don't slap, hit them over the head so hard right away. You know what I mean? Like right. maybe just like, eat, like, you're like, okay, this is a cool vibe. Then nurture and grow that relationship slowly by, you know, having chats or going to the movies or just like talking about industry stuff or, you know, asking, you know, ethical questions of, you know, Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, cause if I'm stuck, instead of just being stuck for 30 days, you can call someone that can give you a piece of advice. And maybe in 30 seconds, you've gotten past that thing. And then your team building your community building. And this industry is all about community and uh, the world is about community. And lastly, I want to say about this is what I just told you, even for me, there's no going back. Like when I want representation, there's no going back to how it was, what I just shared with you. Mm -hmm. I um, am on the forefront with a bunch of people in the NFT space. I've been involved since 2018 and I am 1000% focused on my podcast being a NFT podcast season four of she's all over the place uh, is women empowerment, exploring divine femininity um, and g- giving community information to people in arts and entertainment and business with ethics, morals, and values through the blockchain, through crypto. And so that's on the pulse and that's what's new and that's what's forward. And so anything, Anything else in your mind, in my mind, is an illusion because it's already been done and it's not going to happen that way. So for anything to happen, you can take certain fundamentals and mechanics, but then apply it to the revolution, like the the new, the future, what's next. I mean, CAA, uh, it was on Hollywood Reporter. Um, they, did a, they did a deal with um, CryptoPunks. Um, I was just at Art Basel and... Uh, there are so many like um, Vayner Media was there. Mm-hmm. I met the, the president, um, Jessica, who's the president of Vayner NFT. And they're, they want more women in the space. Um, but there are a lot of people from art, music, fashion, TV, film, like all there, you know, and, and that is there are people who are already doing deals with the blockchain for their films. Like there's already deals happening. So that's the way to move forward. Like when I was a kid, like I said, I looked up to Reese Witherspoon and uh, Meryl Streep and I admired to aspire to, you know, be and grow like them. But what they did was already done. And that was, and now, and now we're, you know, in 2021 here going into 2022. So yeah, that's, um, that's kind of a mouthful, but I hope that adds value. No, what they've done, they've already done is important. And I think that's something that everybody needs to hear, regardless of whether it's acting, because there's people that listen to this that are just purely curious about the industry as well, where, you know, maybe some of the practical advice, you know, they're not going to be an actor, they're not going to do this. But even in business and things, we tend to, to idolize these people who blew up in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s or 2017. And the reality is things change so quickly. Like maybe some principles are good. Maybe some of the principles <clears throat> still apply, but the the means of doing it changes so drastically. And I think what you're sharing is such a, such a valuable approach for people to listen to is, is how can you be on the cutting edge of the next thing, NFTs, whatever that looks like social media a few years ago, you know, I, I mean, it boggles my mind that there were actors who were reticent to get onto social media, you know, when it first came out, you know, you have to take those jumps. And, um, you know, right now, as you're kind of looking at this, you're, you're taking advantage of some of these things and and trying to stay on the, the forefront for someone who's coming into it and saying, I don't have the connections yet. I'm, I'm starting at ground zero, you know, you know, this is great for Katie. You know, she already knew a couple of people before this started, but I'm, I'm in LA, I'm stuck in an apartment. And I don't know how to get out. You know, how do people start forming those initial relationships and how do you kind of avoid some of the, the negative relationships that you can form very easily in this industry? Such a great question. It's so important. And one, one, one simple thing, you can coach with me. I do coaching for industry coaching clients and I can coach you. So you can go to my website, sign up for my newsletter, uh, just book a coaching session with me. Um, because what it is, what I said earlier about cross country running is short term, medium term, long term goals. And so my energy and who you are and the person tuning in, we're at different levels. So what one can do in one week or one month is what someone else is going to do in six months. Mm. So you have, you have to create a, a map up for you. And then 
know the research and be led in the good direction because there's so many, I don't want to say bad people because I don't think people are bad. I just think they're misled. Um, But there has to be some kind of class and clout and ethics and morals and values and getting ourselves right from within. So Mm. if we're going out there and just starting messy, awesome, you're moving the energy. But if we're not straight with ourselves from within, we're going to project that out and we're going to attract more of what we don't want. So, you know, having fundamental tools like Uta Hagen, um, Stanford Meisner, those books, forums, communities, but which forums and communities being very specific, right. About who you listen to. Cause anyone can talk like we're just talking. Anyone can have a podcast. Yeah. There's 1.5 million podcasts. There may be more now because of the pandemic, but like, who are we listening to? Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, I don't want to say I like to hear everything, but I'm open to listening. But then when I calculate and then I'm making those collective choices to make the next step, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what I've cultivated and it's what one can do as well. Um, just it's, it's one step at a time. And the most important thing I really feel is important, no matter what profession someone's in is to have a journal for each area. So music, voiceover, acting, business, whatever it is. And write down your daily goals and write down your your month your monthly goals, write down your long-term goals. It's okay, write them down, write them down. But then take I do an 11 next method. So do 11 things for your business that day. 11 things. If I'm super ex- exhausted like <laughs> you could probably see that I am right now <laughs> from being nonstop for a week, which was amazing. Um, so maybe, maybe one day you're calling 11 people or sending 11 emails and you're like, that that's my 11. That's okay. Mm. But maybe one day you're going to do send 11 emails and you're like, that's my one. I'm going to do 10 more. Right. Mm. So it's, you decide and check in with your personal health of how much you can do that day and yeah. honor self. So not only do it for your artist. But do it for your personal too. So have a journal for your business and then have a journal for your personal. Um, drink a lot of water, eating well, slept a couple hours, um, you know, like took a jacuzzi, you know, like do things that is going to be good for your self-care because everything is mind, body, spirit. We're human beings, not human, human doers. So if, you know, you're doing things for your business, but you're burnt out because you don't have self-care. Um, I also have this 80, 20 rule yeah. where it's like, it's like, no one knows your hundred. No one knows my hundred. So I let people think my, my hundred is I let people think my hundred is my 80. So when I get to 80, I have a mental note to check in with myself. I'm like, how am I doing? Oh, I can go longer mm-hmm. or no. Um, I'm, I'm tired. I better wrap this up or I got to stop right now. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Got to go by. Like that was my hundred people don't know. So then you're honoring self to give yourself that 20% Mm. and then, and, and filling up your own cup. So we're not doing the burnout thing that became so popular, you know, I mean, forever, how long that's been going on, but it's a, you know, epidemic everyone's been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Burnout burnout hustle culture. culture. Yeah. 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 No, there's a, there's a way to do it. That's healthy. Yeah. There's a way to grind. And I think, you know, doing that or doing the, the, the Pomerado, you know, 20 minute bursts of doing a certain task or, you know, there's, there's a lot of different methods to, to kind of, you know, keep that burnout at bay. Um, especially when you're working by yourself. Cause like, even, even just that, like that, that isolation, you know, working by yourself or working, you know, up in an, you know, I'm sitting up here at a desk, you know, if I, if I sit here all day for eight hours, my, my productivity slowly starts going down taking a walk, grabbing water, like all those little things help kind of reboot you a little bit so you can get back to it. Um, Before we go into our kind of final rapid round here, I do want to ask about your work with music because I know you just had a solo album released. Can you just talk a little bit about that, um, what people can expect from that? And I know I'll have a link in the show notes where people can definitely check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Dreamland 1111, it's streaming everywhere. And um, I grew up in the EDM culture in Detroit, Michigan, going to all the parties 
as a kid. And so I love um, future bass and jungle and um, I love dubstep. And so this album is about um, exploring divine femininity in all genders. And so it kind of couples with the podcast coming up, but I shot two music videos. One's called Dreamland 1111. Uh, one's called Miracles Go to Mars. So you can have them in the show notes if you want the videos, yeah. but. I, I did the music and it was a birthday gift to myself to release the album and, you know, to share my gifts with people, with you, you know, with the listener. Mm-hmm. And, um, I did the video and I landed in LA and it just manifested and it became two videos. And it's like something I can put on social media because of what you were saying earlier with social media, what we were talking about is like, you know, a lot of like directors and casting directors and people in the industry follow me. So when they see you, it's like, Oh, what work have you done lately? Like what work Mm. have you done? Or what have you been in? So if you take you know, if you have good aesthetics and quality content and you put it out there, then it's like, oh, okay, here's my music. Here's a video that I directed, produced, starred in. It's my voice. I do voiceovers and acting. A director, producer, casting director could see that and be like, oh, wow, this would be good for this TV show episode. Mm. Or, oh, I re- I remember I saw this girl and it was that vibe. And then they look up my account and they could call my team and then book me on a union project. So being creative and putting the content out there, yeah, you know, or you're putting it out there, people see it. And mm-hmm. it's a, it's a way in the 21st century to um, let people know who you are, you know, cause we're all yearning to be seen, to be heard uh, for our ideas to be produced. So if I'm a producer, if you need something produced, call me. If you, if you're not a producer, find a producer in your community coach with the producer, find out, you know, an outline of what you need to do to make it happen and get past emotions and just do it and show up and do it. And then, because what happens is you have an idea and it ruminates for five months, five years, 10 years, and it's not done. I've done it. I know. But like when I, when I do, when I get myself a hard stop, like I'm going to do this, this is the hard stop. And whatever, however it is, that's how it's going to be. And I'm, I'm going to be done with it. So I'm going to move on to something else. Or uh, I might need another week or two. And But I give myself a hard stop. And then I give myself a um, some room to say, okay, I'm going to give myself another week or two. You know, I befriend myself. I'm kind to myself, not being mean to myself. Say, hey, I'm doing my best, right? Um, and then, but the important thing is to ha- create the idea to birth it. And that's, a, that's the gift. Mm-hmm. And to make it happen. Yeah. And then be done with it and put it out into the world and not hold the the, the, the the gentle, subtle thing is not holding on to the expectation of the illusion of how you want people to perceive it and how you want people to see it, because that's conditional, yeah. right? Unconditional is accepting and allowing whatever it may be. The, mm-hmm. the gift was that it came through us. How people perceive it is not up to us because we're not them and it's art and the gift is... The gift is having someone else feel something that we've made, but how can we see that if you're not putting it out and you're not taking actions to make it happen? Right. Yeah. Even if it's an imperfect action, even if it's not everything you imagine in your mind, it could be, cause it never will be, you know, just taking that step, putting it out and, and, you know, it just on a practical side, like if you're connected with producers or actors or people you want to connect with agents, whoever, and they see you posting you know, every week or posting a podcast episode or doing a YouTube short, like you're putting yourself at the top of their mental Rolodex every single week. And that alone is worth the time to, to keep it out there. Um, look, I, this is super helpful. And I know there's a lot of people pulling practical information. I want to move into our kind of rapid round and uh, run through a couple quick questions. Curious to hear your answer on these. Uh, first of all, if you were given the green light to remake any film, uh, what would you choose and why? Oh, Clueless, because I just love Alicia Silverstone. Everyone said probably narcissistic here or egotistical, but everyone always said like, oh, 
like, you know, you look like a young Alicia Silverstone, you look like a young Alicia Silverstone, but I love fashion. It was a lot of fun. Um, I just, it's, it just seems like, it just seems like a time in life where I was like this little girl with little girl dreams. And like, I just thought it was like, so cool, you know, everything about it. So it probably, I don't want to say how, how it would look because it's, it was timeless, but clueless would be a fun one to be able to get my friends involved and and make it together. Cause I definitely have a clueless crew. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Who do you think is most underrated filmmaker working right now? Mm, That's a really good question. Um, Maybe Lars, you know, he did um, Nymphomaniacs. He's Mm -hmm. the director from um, Denmark. Um, Probably, probably, yeah, probably Lars. Yeah. I love him. Yeah, he's uh, definitely not a mainstream uh, mainstream choice, but but uh, he's putting out some interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. What do you think is the best decade of film history? Uh, oh wow, probably the thirties. <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah, probably the thirties. Uh, I spent a few Christmases ago for just two weeks. I just watched Charlie Chaplin, nineteen thirties, forties, fifties. I just I was just marathoning all the all the all the films. It was great. It just really moved me. Hmm. Yeah. Is there something about that period that you really like? Is it the dialogue or the, or what is it that yeah. really stands out? The language, the dialogue, um, the cinematography, everything was like a lot of it, a lot of it's uh, um, black and white, um, you know, just the language and the way they communicated with each other was just right. really eye opening to say how, where we were and where we are now, you know, as, as a, a species. Yeah. Right. hundred um, percent. What is a movie that people would be surprised to hear that you enjoy? A movie? Yeah. Mm, that they would be surprised. I can tell you, can I tell you my favorite movie or is it, is that a different question? No, it, it can be your favorite movie, um, but it would be typically like if someone's someone knows you love Clueless, but they're surprised that you love this movie because it seems so out of character for you, or it's it doesn't seem like something you pop on on a Friday night. Hmm. Well, Amadeus is my favorite favorite movie. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, Milos Forman. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if someone would be surprised that, but I love, I love classical music. So I, I grew up on classical music. So maybe someone would be surprised about that. Well, you just mentioned, uh, you just mentioned like Nymphomaniac, which I think would be a, probably a bigger <laughs> shock. Um, oh, okay. How about blue is the warmest color? Oh, that's amazing. Blue is, is the that, warmest is color. that Leah Sado? She, she's um, the main. There's two, one's Greek and I don't, I'm not sure if that's her name. The other one. Hmm. Interesting. Blue um, is the warmest color. It's amazing. What of your performances do you think is the best representation of you as a creator? And this could even be your music that you just put out. It could be a, a certain role. It could be, uh, you know, it could be something you've written. What do you think is the best kind of purest representation of you as a creative? Mm, what comes to my mind is when I was on Cold Case because. I played a poet and first and foremost, out of everything, I'm a poet. So um, that's what that's what comes as my intuitive hit. If someone took my poetry away, I would totally be in a mental hospital. Well, you've given a lot of invaluable advice on this episode, but I have to ask, what is the number one piece of advice that you would give to any aspiring filmmaker that's listening to this episode? Oh, invest in yourself. One thousand mm-hmm. uh, percent in every every which way, even financial. Um I would invest in myself in acting classes and coachings and research, um, audiobooks, networking, my time, watching movies, everything. Um, but I would not invest in myself, for example, like just putting five thousand dollars down or something down to to make something happen for me. I expected it and wanted it from an angel investor, from a man. When I was a kid, I was taught like I was a man's world. So I would look to men as role models and that's completely changed now, but I looked for the validation outside of myself. So I employ mm-hmm. you to um, look from within. And even if you don't have the means, and I've many times haven't had the means, um, just take the risk, take the fall and very poetic. You'll see it was worth it after all. But like I said earlier, um, one step at a time. And if you, if you just, how is that going to happen? How am I going to raise the 5,000? How am I going to raise the 300,000? How am I going to raise the 3 million? 
But if you just are in your head and we just don't take that first on that first step, we just take the first step to be messy. We start talking to people. The path starts to shape shift different ways and allowing not so much control over it and allowing it to be more open. We open ourselves to the universe where the universe will take care of us and they do provide, and it may not be the way we want it to, and it may not be what we thought it should be, but we have to have a deep faith in knowing that it is divine intervention of how it's supposed to be, because it's a lot to decipher if it's ego or if it's something we really want. So, you know, getting clear on those things, if it's for the ego, you know, and doing the self work. So there's so like, know thyself, right? Socrates, know thyself. So internal work and trust self more, have more faith with self and be involved with people like me and communities to take those actionable steps. Because like I said, the exterior thing is just, it's, it's a dead end. It's a dead Mm -hmm. end. Hmm. Know thyself. Well, Katie, thank you so much for letting us get to know you a little bit as well. And for giving so much really helpful advice and you know, practical, tactical advice for people who are listening, who are wanting to find themselves in some of the positions you've been uh, blessed and worked hard to get to in your career. And uh, I hope this isn't the last time that we chat. Yeah, definitely. Eric, I'm so grateful. And um, let's connect again when like I'm on a show or something like that. Yeah, we'll definitely. Come back on and you know, show the people what's up. For sure. For sure. Sounds good. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Film School Podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, don't forget to leave a five-star review and hit subscribe so you won't miss a single episode.